Welcome to Fire and Ice. Today I want to talk about a very talented and underrated guitar player. He played in a band you may have heard of. Sabotage. I'm talking about the amazing Christopher Michael Oliva, better known as Chris Oliva. I want to concentrate on the albums he recorded, but I just want to touch on how we got here. I discovered Sabotage on Much Music's Power Hour, which is Canada's equivalent to MTV's Headbangers Ball. I remember they played 24 hours ago in Hall of the Mountain King videos back to back. I think Chris and John were guests on the show from Toronto because they ended up on tour with Dio for that album. Anyways, I was too young to go to that show but the next day I did buy the Hall of the Mountain King cassette and I'm pretty sure it was in my Walkman for at least a month. I was just in awe of their musicality and, of course, Chris's guitar playing. For the most part, I was heavily into players like Eddie Van Halen, Rick Emmett, Glenn Tipton, and Randy Rhodes by the late 80s, but Chris incorporated all those guys, and to me he's still my favorite guitar player of all time. Did you know that Sabotage toured with Megadeth as well as Dio in 1987 and 88? Did you also know that Dave Mustaine tried to recruit Chris for Megadeth? Imagine that band. Sadly, Chris only really had a 10-year recording career, from the album Sirens in 1983 to Edge of Thorns in 1993. In the early morning hours of October 17, 1993, Chris and his wife Dawn were heading home from a concert when a drunk driver coming from the other direction crossed the median and struck their car head-on. Chris was killed instantly. The band did carry on after Chris's death, with Alex Skolnick of Testament guesting on 1994's Handful of Rain. In 1995, they would release a concept album based on the Bosnian War, Dead Winter Dead. This album would include an instrumental track called Christmas Eve, Sarajevo 1224. This would later be released again, but under a new seasonal band called Trans-Siberian Orchestra. But that's another story. Wake of Magellan was released in 1997. And the final album in 2001, Poets and Madmen. These are decent albums, but for me, without Chris on guitar, and John leaving the microphone after Streets, it just wasn't the same. There's an article from Classic Rock dated March 2010 saying quote, There's a guitar solo at the end of Sabotage's Streets, a rock opera. No, it's more than a guitar solo, this is something truly special, outstanding. Use any superlative you like, but no words can capture the grace, emotion and poetry of this particular piece of music. It's in the song Believe, and the man responsible was to die two years later. He remains almost unknown outside of diehard Sabotage fans, but deserves so much more. His name, Chris Oliva. End quote. I couldn't agree more. Anyone who's ever heard what this man was capable of achieving on the guitar will agree that here was a remarkable, unique talent. Someone with an affinity for his instrument that few others can equal. Their debut, Sirens, from 1983 is a classic early 80s metal album. It definitely has early stages of power metal with some doom overtones. The band was writing more storytelling, than gruesome or satanic lyrics. The first three tracks, Sirens, Holocaust, I believe are great, with Chris showing what he can do. And Rage is almost speed metal. On the Run has a cool galloping riff, and Chris's solos flourishes are splashed all over. But I thin the rest of the album starts to dip ever so slightly, and not as interesting. Out on the streets closes and I think John was trying his best Robert Plant impersonation here. They would re-record it later. The Dungeons Are Calling is an EP released in 1985. The tracks were recorded at the same time as Sirens and were meant to be one album, but were divided due to time restraints on vinyl at the time. It's a loosely based concept album and the title track, contrary to popular belief, is not about hell or torture, but about the horrors of drug use. The song used many metaphors, which have been sometimes misunderstood. The cover is a picture of a human skull with a homemade syringe, a reference to the title track of the album. Personally, I don't think there's a bad song on this EP. All the songs are great. My favorite one is By the Grace of the Witch. Chris absolutely shreds on this one. Visions is a three-minute speed metal masterpiece. Midas Knight, another fast-paced galloping rocker, has some of John's best wailing vocals. City Beneath the Surface opens with some gothic-style synths and a slow march, but builds into a shredder. I used to jam this song with a band I was in during the 90s. Another one of Chris's best solos. The Whip is a fast-paced closer to this brilliant EP. All the tracks kick ass. Power of the Night was also released in 1985, and would be the band's Atlantic Records debut, and second full-length album. 
It opens with a 1 minute synth intro and then Chris blazes with a cool opening riff and some whammy bar dives. The solo is also amazing. Warriors is also a kick-ass tune with some tempo changes and of course, Chris rips this one up. Washed Out is a 2 minute and 15 second speed metal head banger. Skull Session is also notable one with Chris showing more of his wizardry. The record was not originally pressed with a parental advisory sticker on the cover. However, Atlantic Records did have a problem with some of the sexual metaphors mentioned in Hard For Love and Skull Session. It was also a marketing ploy to encourage more people to buy the record as a result of it being banned by some outlets. They were going to release a video for Hard For Love, but only if the band changed the name of the song to Hot For Love. They voted against this, so the video was never made. Released in 1986, Fight for the Rock is largely regarded as the band's worst release by both fans and band members, with the band referring to it as Fight for the Nightmare. Atlantic Records wanted the band to begin writing pop rock songs for other artists on the label. However, the label eventually turned around and told the band to record the music that Oliva had written for other artists themselves. This destroyed the band's credibility in the eyes of the press and reviews were not kind to the band. Atlantic also wanted the band to have photographs taken, since none of their previous releases had included any. The band hired a friend to do the photography work, with one of the photos featuring the band recreating the famous photo, raising the flag on Iwo Jima, which is depicted on the cover. The title track is listenable, and Out on the Streets is a re-recording of a song from Sirens. The rest of the album is mid-tempo, without any real blazers or head-banging tunes. It's book ended with Red Light Paradise, which is a good tune, showcasing Chris as a viable guitar hero for the mid-80s. Released in 1987 under the direction of producer Paul O'Neill. Hall of the Mountain King is their first album produced by O'Neill, who was assigned to the band after the failure of Fight for the Rock, and to salvage any hope of not being dropped by the record label. The producer's influence pushed Sabotage to adopt a conceptual progressive metal style beginning with this album. And man, did it work. From start to finish, this album rips. A side note, Prelude to Madness is an arrangement of Greeds in the Hall of the Mountain King. The intro of Prelude to Madness features keyboards and guitar playing Mars, the bringer of war from Gustav Holst's suite, The Planets. The song would be re-recorded by Trans-Siberian Orchestra in 2009 under the title of The Mountain, appearing on that group's fifth studio album, Night Castle. The list of tracks on this one, from 24 hours ago, which I mentioned earlier, had more of Chris's dive bombs and solos between verses. But my all-time favorite is Beyond the Doors of the Dark. A really haunting song that starts to show John's painful shrieks, and of course, Chris. Wow, what can I say? Two songs in, and I was hooked. Strange Wings, is a melodic mid-paced rocker which starts with Chris, blazing of course. It's got such a catchy hook and a sing-along chorus. Another song I used to jam. The solo section is a little different in timing, and this is where Chris definitely takes off. It also has a guest appearance of Ray Gillen, of Badlands, singing harmonies with John. The aforementioned prelude to Madness opens side 2 with a few thunderclaps separating the title track. One word. Genius. The price you pay follows strange wings and tempo, also with a great hook and chorus. White, which is another tune that covers the horrors of drug use, mainly cocaine, hence the title. Devastation closes out this brilliant album, with lyrics about the fallout of nuclear war. There is an instrumental, Last Dawn, in which Chris displays some beautiful arpeggios. Named obviously for his wife. This album really put the band on the map, and as mentioned before, they would open Ronnie James Dio's Dream Evil Tour, finally playing arenas. Metal Hammer also listed it as number 8 as the greatest power metal albums of all time. Absolute masterpiece and my favorite sabotage album. 10 out of 10. Gutter Ballet is the fifth full-length album and the second album created under the direction of producer Paul O'Neill. This album was a true turning point for the band, as the sound transitioned from heavy metal to experiment with a more progressive sound. It also featured a second guitar player, Chris Caffrey, who would later be the main MC and guitarist for Trans-Siberian Orchestra and taking Oliva's duties after his death. Of Rage and War starts the album, where Devastation left off. Again about the ravages of war has a cool bass and drums intro with Chris and John trading vocal and guitar swells before it takes off. The title track shows where the band was headed on this one with a piano intro and symphony playing behind it. More of Chris's guitar mastery here. Temptation Revelation would have John's piano and Chris's guitar trading harmonies here. More symphonic elements in the second half. The guitar and symphony battling it out like prelude to madness. Awesome stuff.
the seeds of Trans-Siberian Orchestra are definitely being planted here. When the Crowds Are Gone is another piano opener and slower paced semi-ballad, which is my standout song on this album, mainly because it was used for my wedding reception's closing song. The video was on regular rotation on Headbangers Ball. Silk and Steel is an instrumental showcase of Chris's finger-picking talent. And Hounds, another haunting song. Not as up-tempo as Beyond the Doors of the Dark, but still chilling. Love this one. The melodic solo section picks up the pace before the band slows it down again. The ending rips with more soloing by Chris Blazing here. Brilliant album, but doesn't touch Hall of the Mountain King. But still an amazing follow-up. Streets A Rock Opera, from 1991, is a rock opera dealing with the rise and fall of the fictional musician D.T. Jesus. It was John Oliva's last album as lead vocalist until 1995's Dead Winter Dead and 1997's The Wake of Magellan, where he shared lead vocal duties with Zach Stevens. He resumed lead vocal duties exclusively on 2001's Poets and Madmen. The concept of Streets is based on a book written by Paul O'Neill in 1979 as a Broadway play and stored in a drawer at home until Chris found it and suggested it be Sabotage's next album. Sabotage would have liked to call the record Gutter Ballet as the original play written by O'Neill, but the inclusion of the song on their previous record made it impossible. The title opener, Jesus Saves, the only video from this album, Tonight He Grins Again, are the true guitar pieces on this album. Strange Reality has a cool hook and groove to it as well. But to me, the standout track is the closing number, Believe. It reminds me of when the crowds are gone and the solo and it truly show Chris's guitar playing as the band started a new decade. Edge of Thorns was released on April 6, 1993 and this would be the last album to feature Chris Oliva, who died six months after its release, and their first release with Zach Stevens on lead vocals, following the departure of John Oliva from his role as singer, although he did produce and write songs for the album. This album, I must admit, took a few listens for me to get into. Probably because it didn't feature John on vocals. But I did love the piano intro to the title track. Over the years, I will say that the guitar solo is one of my favorite of Chris's. He carves his stone start slow but picks up and has more cool riffs and a melodic solo section. Lights Out is a total metal head banger with Chris shredding right out of the gate. Follow Me is one of the deep cuts that has a cool melodic vocal by Zach during the pre-chorus. It has many tempo changes and emotions. Undertones of television evangelists that were all over TV at the time. Degrees of Sanity is cool mid-paced rocker, but Conversation Piece is my go-to from this album. Awesome start-stop intro and Zach once again showing his melodic voice. The pre-chorus is also really catchy. All That I Bleed is the piano ballad from this album. It may be the typical power ballad but Chris absolutely kills with the solo. Another song that had grown on me over the years is Miles Away. Edge of Thorns ends with an acoustic ballad with just Chris and Zach singing. It was the last song John and Chris ever wrote. My friends and I still talk about Chris's playing all these years later, and we pretty much agree that he was one of a kind. A career and life cut way too short by a drunk idiot. This April, Chris would have turned 60 years old. Would we still have gotten genius music from him? Would he have gone in another direction? We'll never know. Like Ronnie James Dio, Lemmy, Dimebag Daryl, and all the other greats we've lost, the music still lives on. There was a live tribute album released in late 1995 by the band and it's an absolute scorcher. Recorded between 1987 and 1990, Ghost in the Ruins has all the classic sabotage tunes. From Sirens to Gutter Ballet, and of course a shredder of a guitar solo by Chris leading into Hall of the Mountain King. If you love guitar-driven classic metal, and haven't heard this criminally underrated band, the music is out there so check it out. Of course fans of TSO, should know where the roots of that great live attraction came from. Sabotage did it 10 years before they blew up the Christmas season. I always waited for their encores, the four times I've seen TSO, because I knew they would do a few Sabotage instrumentals. It was the closest thing to seeing and hearing that on stage. Until next time.